Somewhere in the backyard, kids are enjoying a rocket party. Mothers are busy cooking and dads are busy grilling and discussing playing baseball on Mars. Here we learn Woody and his wife Terry are being sent to Mars together, with which the ladies seem skeptical. Outside, Luke is waiting for a friend as he thinks he deserves the party too, as all his friends are here, and it's his last night on Earth, to which his wife Deb says it's his last night with them too, and suggests he spend some time with Bobby, his son. Bobby is sad about his bedtime stories and not finishing their book, to which Luke suggests he will take his copy that way. They both can read a little every night, even though they will be far apart. Just as the mood lightens, a car enters with Luke's friend Jim in it. Deb and Luke greet him with open arms. That night, Woody and Luke are having a banter about a mission while Jim is trying not to meddle in. Just then, Luke says three commanders in one crew, no amount of fuel could lift the aircraft. The men bask in the thought of being a team, but Jim is not on it. While the men joke around with each other, Jim mentions Maggie, his dead wife, and how she would have loved to see them one more time. This statement makes the moment solemn. After a while, Woody leaves and Luke says that Jim and Maggie should have been his mission if only he had not pulled out to take care of Maggie when she was sick. Even though Jim does not want to hear it, Luke continues that he did want this assignment but not like this, and that he would give this mission up if he could bring Maggie back. Luke, however, hands the mission over quite gracefully, and they separate on good terms. Luke walks towards the playhouse, which is labeled Mars, and puts his footprint on the mud. Thirteen months later, on Sidonia Mars, a robot is collecting data, and Luke is digging on a rock. Suddenly, Rena, another crew member, calls him back to look at something. Back at the station, the whole crew is inspecting an upwelling that looks like ice on a latitude which is not possible. Luke decides they will venture up there and sends word to the space station that they suspect they found crystallized water substance, a key to permanent human civilization. The group reaches the site and hears some weird sounds. While they run tests, it reads that there is metal present which baffles Luke and he asks Rene to run more tests. While they run new tests, the technology suddenly shuts down and the small sand dunes in front of the crew blow away and turn into a tornado-like snake. It screeches and follows the crew trying to gobble them up. The tornado stones hit Ren first, eat the other two boys and subside, revealing a statue face. Somewhere else, Woody and Terry are on a ship romancing their time away when they get a message report from Ray the commander. They learn about the catastrophic amount of energy that hit the crew and hear Luke's message about the attack and death of the crew. The team back at the station try to convince the commander to send Woody and Terry for a recovery mission as there seems to be a lot to uncover. Even though they don't have much data about the condition of landing on Mars, the commander agrees and sets Jim to formulate a plan. After all leave, Woody tells the commander that he does not have the right crew for the mission and that he wants Jim to fly in the right seat. Commander denies it as Jim refused to take some psych evaluation making him ineligible. Still. Woody debates that all Jim did was show emotions when his wife died in front of his eyes, and they all know that he is the best they have got for the mission. Mission Day 137 The Mars recovery team get a signal of a big dust storm headed to the base camp, which might make their landing difficult. They wait for SEMA, which will orbit Mars at 0600 tomorrow, giving them an idea if they came all this way for something or not. They wait for the reports while dancing the night away. A packet arrives which shows the stable base and radiation levels in three graves. As the team tries to check the disaster grounds, a magnetic field interferes with their view making Jim suspicious of something. They report this to the station making their mission a go. Jim spends the night watching the whole crew watching their wedding video where Maggie gives a speech about Mars being a place which has superstition in almost all cultures, and that might mean something as the universe is not chaos, it's connection. Woody adds that if the storm was not a quake, then something else caused it or planned it. They suspect that Maggie might be right to believe something is down there, and they make a deal not to leave without finding out. The crew run the last test when they get hit by micrometeoroids injuring Phil and facing a breach in the aircraft. While they seal the hole and lose pressure in the craft, Phil suggests if they maintain enough pressure he can reboot the machines. Woody goes out to find the breach, and Phil searches for the wire to reboot. While all this, Jim shuts the gravitational rotation of the ship and makes Terry squeeze out Dr. Pepper to find the breach. As they find the breach, Jim loses consciousness as he has no helmet on, and the atmosphere is at 10%. The reboot is successful, and Jim wakes up just in time to enter Mars orbit. While the crew fuels the engines, there is a hole in the fuel pipes leaking the fuel the crew counts down, unknown of the fact. Jim fears the engine causing a blast and separation of the craft and engine. Seeing no way out, Jim decides to abandon ship and ink to Remo. They all head out into the atmosphere but find the Remo too far away. 
At the risk of missing it, Woody hands a gun to Jim and runs a line to the Remo alone. On the way, he runs out of fuel and abandons the suit jets, which leads him to make the contact at a high velocity, and he stumbles off the Remo, drifting into space. Jim hands the gun to Terry and asks them to go forward as they latch onto the Remo. They run the numbers and don't have sufficient fuel to retrieve Woody on their suit jets, leaving the only way to get Woody back is scooping him through Remo. But recalibrating the Remo takes too much time, which would mean Woody will enter the atmosphere. The three latch onto the Remo and start the prep to get into it. Not being able to leave Woody Terry reset her fuel and shoots forward. Terry says she does not want to see him die and that he would do the same for her, but Woody stops her saying what she is doing is impossible and he would not do it if it was impossible. She stops and shoots the gun onto Woody, but unfortunately the rope is short for the distance missing him by an inch. Terry wants to try to jet a little closer and try again as she does not want to lose him, but that would make it impossible for her to get back meaning death for the whole team as they need her to reach the surface. Woody cannot let the whole team die, so he blows one last kiss to Terry and opens his helmet and drifts into oblivion. Jim calls Terry back and she returns. Back at the space station, Commander Ray gets news that the Remo got out of orbit and reached the surface with power making him realize that the team landed using the Remo and says nobody else but Jim could achieve this. At Mars, the three reach the base and put up their flag. They inspect the condition of the base. They find that the ERV still has oxygen in it, and Jim finds that there are plants thriving in the greenhouse. As Jim opens his helmet, a figure appears behind him, trying to attack him. It turns out to be Luke who attacks him, but Jim brings him back to his senses, and Luke recognizes them all. He also realizes that Woody did not make it. After a while, Jim asks Luke about what happened and he tells them that a force came out of the mountain and killed them all but spared him and he does not understand why. Luke says after a while he figured it happened because someone needed to figure out the secret. Luke guides them somewhere but the team believes that his brain is affected because of the low gravity exposure. Jim has some empathy and believes it's a miracle he survived there so long in his situation. Jim explains that they have no rocket, no water food, or even spare oxygen making Luke question on the mission but the team shows him new nav boards for the ERV, their tickets to Earth. Luke explains how he barely made it back to base and dared to go find their bodies, but he could find only Wrens. They hear the storm raging at a distance and Jim asks Luke about the force they saw. Luke realizes that Jim does not believe him and tells him it's okay, but he knows he is not crazy. When asked about the secret, Luke explains that thousands of years have passed and the surface has changed so much through impacts that they did not see it before as there was too much dirt. When asked about what Luke shows them, an image of a head lying on the surface shocking the whole team. Jim asks about the sound that he heard, so Luke explains that it's the key. Luke plays it and shows them that the sound has a pattern, mathematical patterns. Luke explains that a pattern of 333 when combined in a graph makes the formation of DNA. Luke explains it's a signature self-portrait of whatever species created the face. But Jim says that DNA looks human, which Terry denies as it's missing the last pair of chromosomes. Jim says that is close again, making Terry deny, as she says the difference between human and ape DNA is 3%, which makes the difference between ape and Einstein and Mozart. After freshening up, they do a supply check, leading to Jim dropping some M&Ms on the floor, which ends up making the shape of the DNA again. Jim realizes that it's not a signature, but a test asking them for the right answer. When asked why Jim says it wants them to put in the right chromosomes to prove that they are humans, Luke says that they fired lasers and radars, to which Jim says that might have considered that as a wrong answer and defended himself. Phil asks what happens if it gets the right answer, to which Jim says they need to find out. Jim asks Luke to go backwards and find the sound of the missing part and dub them into the recording signal. Phil stops Jim saying three people have died due to that thing, and Terry corrects him by adding Woody. Jim tries to convince Terry that if they don't get answers, they all died in vain, but Luke stops them all saying they don't have to go out there. They send a robot to the site and fire the signal onto the face. All fall silent and a light shines from the face, making everyone so happy as they see it as a gesture of invitation. Jim asks Luke if the rover still works and they all go there leaving Phil behind with instructions to launch the ERV at 1950 hours with or without them. Terry asks if Jim is sure he wants to do this, to which he replies he is not sure about anything anymore, but he did not come a hundred million miles to turn back. The three enter face while Phil starts the ERV and starts downloading the software. The team is back at the face inspecting their solid footing. Suddenly the opening closes behind them, trapping them. Phil loses contact with them. Jim tests the environment in there and opens his suit realizing there is atmospheric pressure there, which is supposed to be impossible on Mars' surface. 
They realize air is present there, and they open their helmets. As they do that, a door opens behind them, and they head in. They see the entire solar system where Mars looks like Earth. Suddenly, a meteoroid hits it, making it the way it is now. Suddenly, a figure appears behind them and greets them. The figure shows them how its civilization fled the destruction of Mars, but one stayed behind. The figure shows how that one ship took that DNA and landed on Earth, and the evolution of mankind happened. Making the Earth we know now. Jim holds the Martian's hand, making a circle around Earth, realizing they seeded Earth. They are us, and we are them. The Martian reveals some circles and disappears. Suddenly they can hear Phil, who informs them that the storm is getting bad and they need to return now, or it will hit them. Jim realizes that they are on a ship and the countdown has already started. Luke and Terry run for the exit, but Jim stays behind, when Terry says they have to get back home. Jim tells them that she was right. This is an invitation to follow them home, and he is going as he was born for this. Like Maggie said, to stand on a new world and look beyond it to the next one. He says this is right for him, and they are losing time as they have to get back to the ERV and get off this planet. Luke thanks him for saving his life, and Terry wishes if only Woody could see him. Terry hands Jim his rocket necklace, as she knows Woody would have wanted him to have it. Terry and Luke head out, but cannot reach Phil, who is constantly calling for them. Jim steps into the circle and gets transported to the ship, just as the rover heads on without a map in view. One minute till launch, Luke believes they can't get back, but Terry believes otherwise. Just in time, Phil hears Luke that they are getting back and loses his mind. Jim, however, gets submerged in water but realizes he can breathe. Jim's ship leaves as he thinks back to all his happy memories, and so do the other three.